Hello and welcome to Psych Sessions, conversations about teaching and stuff. I'm Garth Newfeld, along with Eric Landrum, your podcast hosts. As the name implies, we center on conversations about teaching, but we often veer into other interesting topics, which is the in stuff. This is episode number 132, where Eric had the opportunity to interview Dr. Regan A.R. Gurung from Oregon State University in Corvallis, Oregon. But before we get to that, we want to thank you for listening to Psych Sessions. Thanks for your support. If you've never had a chance to rate Psych Sessions on Apple Podcasts, we invite you to go there right now and leave a rating, uh, as this helps people find us and will help Psych Sessions ultimately get out to more teachers of psychology. Also, feel free to use Psych Sessions in your courses or with your grad students. In fact, if you use Psych Sessions in such a way, please let us know. We've got programming related to writing, career, professional development, and more. In fact, this week, we launched a new series with host Chris Hakala called Psych Sessions on teaching and learning centers. If you have an idea for Psych Sessions, please reach out to us. We are easy to find. Thanks. Now, before you hear the interview with Regan Gurung, please allow me to share some listening tips and some of my favorite moments. Friends, it just doesn't get any better than this. Get your notepads out because Eric and Regan are going to have a teaching conversation. Well, and so much more. Uh, I'll get back to that in a moment. But um, if you want to hear Regan's backstory um, as a Psych Sessions listener, it's fascinating, by the way. You just have to go back about four years to do it. So uh, on December 26, 2017, we released episode 12, and that was part one with Regan A.R. Gurung. And um, that episode was Eric interviewing him. I don't know why I'm not getting the chance to interview Regan ever, but um, I think it's selfish, Eric, by the way. Um, but this is part two today. Part one was episode 12. Um, Regan also did um, episode five of intro psych sessions that was like one of our first side series and he was uh episode five you can hear how he runs uh his intro psych uh course well did run it um but this is different this is a different sort of episode this is just a great interview um like an update on what's been going on with regan for the last four years and there's been a lot going on uh, this is a behind the scenes look at what being a leader in the teaching of psychology looks like. And there's many ways to do it, and there's many great people and many great leaders, and Regan is just one, but he is he is a generational one. Eric asks Regan a lot of questions about how he makes that work, how has he contributed, what he has contributed to teaching of psychology. We're going to hear about all those hints and hacks. They're going to get into how to manage time, um, how to save time, how to say no, how to figure out what to say yes to. Um, Regan talks about those things that have helped him, um, supportive family, collaborators that he likes to work with, that he has a lot of fun with. Uh, yeah, so that's a really interesting part of the uh, interview, particularly how he learned to say yes uh, to only certain things and identify those. So there you go. Um, that's always hard for us academics to say no to things. Okay. Uh, but this is this is. Uh, Eric and Regan really going into uh, kind of a reflection on the previous years, but also a reflection on what they've learned about teaching. Uh, so it's it's fun. Uh, okay, so this is uh, this interview starts with uh, Eric pushing Regan uh, to update us on what's been going on um, and why you would take your family and you would uh, move them across the country um, and what kind of uh, thoughts go into those sorts of decisions, those sorts of big decisions, moving from the University of Wisconsin in Green Bay to Oregon, um, to Oregon State University in Corvallis, Oregon. Um, what was there that would make someone move everything, change everything after 20 years uh, with the wonderful relationships that Regan had built uh, at the University of Wisconsin, Green Bay, and um, all of the opportunities that he had there, what would make someone move institutions? So if you are interested in that, 
kind of con- conversation and consideration, you're going to get a behind the scenes look here as well. Uh, Regan's going to talk to us about his new position uh, there at Oregon State University because after he got his uh, position over there, uh, teaching in research and service, I imagine as well, they offered a second job to him. And so, by the way, lots of shout shout outs and love for um, Dr. Kathy Becker Bleese over there at Oregon State University. So if you are a KBB fan, then you are going to uh, appreciate uh, the love that is shown to her as well. So uh, how did uh, Regan manage this new position, this new double position? How is he doing both? Uh, They get into that answer. And along with his research and teaching and publishing Um, Eric pushes him to talk to us about efficiency and how he pulls it off. I'm not satisfied. I'm just going to put it out there. Regan, there's something else. I'm with Eric. I'm not quite buying it um, because we do our best with efficiency, us mere mortals, and um, and we can't quite get to what you've accomplished. So uh, especially with your, I think you're getting eight hours sleep. I think we get into that. So Regan ends um, this conversation being prepared. Imagine that Regan Garung prepared. Um, but yes, he, he finishes with a few things that he wants to, um, talk about like remote work and, um, giving folks without a voice, uh, an opportunity to, uh, get into maybe the publishing world and to, uh, the, I should say the authoring world. So you'll want to listen for that because he does call out. If you want to um, work on a health psych book, um, there is a little nugget in here for you. Uh, folks, this is pure gold, uh, except that it's free. And now get a pen so that you can take notes because this is Regan A.R. Gurung with Eric Landrum. Well, welcome back to another installment of Psych Sessions. And I say this with a smile on my face because this <laughs> is always a treat uh, to have a part two in our titles means that we're having a guest come back for a second time, and you'll recognize this gentleman. Hi, Regan. Hi, hey, Eric. I was just thinking about that actual room that we sat in when we did part one. Part one with Regan Gorong was conducted the Saturday morning of an epic conference. This is one of these things I actually remember. I'm sorry, I don't remember the meal that was associated with it like you normally do. But uh, Epic Conference at the University of Wisconsin, Green Bay, in Green Bay, Wisconsin, I'm going to say probably 2018, probably, probably way back then. And a couple of things have changed, haven't they? Absolutely. I mean, you know, worldwide and personally as well. So, wow, what, a, what an interesting uh, time period to look back on. So... So we've got a lot of things to talk about, and and eventually there'll probably be a part three if we can get you to do it, but today's part two. Uh, Let's start, I want to, actually, I want to start with something more closer to home. What are you teaching this semester? So this term, because we're now in the the quarters. Oh, forgive me. Yes, you're you're on quarters. That's right. This, so this term, I teach a gen psych course, part one of a two part sequence. I teach a, a graduate student teaching seminar to psychology graduate students who are all TAs now, but who will be teaching their own course next term. And then I'm teaching a university wide graduate seminar to about 30 students in in a asynchronous format where we go over various elements of the art and craft and science of teaching. So I got to ask you, how many students in your gen cycle? A wonderful 355. 355. Are those face-to-face or online or? This is is all face-to-face. And I think it's the even though attendance numbers have been dropping, a sizable, healthy portion do show up to class. So we have some good face-to-face, fully masked. Oregon State is a mask mandate, vaccine mandate university. So yeah, masks on. So do you get any pushback from your students that if you have a vaccine mandate, why do they have to wear masks? So... Actually, no. So, th- so I have not received any pushback. And I think in classic talk to talk, walk to walk fashion, I addressed the mandate on the very first day of class. 
in the f- first five minutes of class and sort of head off, tr- headed off trouble at the pass, as it were, put in some good examples as to why. And no, not a single person has said anything to me in class. Gotcha. Now, and I look around and every once in a while, if I see a mask slipping, I tap my nose to and look at the person to remind them to get it back over their, over their noses. But that's very rare that I have to do that. And yeah, so it's been... Personally, I've, and I, and I'm, and I, you know, talk to a lot of faculty on this campus and, but we haven't had on this campus had a mask pushback that I know of. So I consider, I, I like that. I like that notion. I mean, of course, like everybody, we're all wondering when the masks can go down. And the day we are recording this was the first day that I heard on national public radio that schools are now beginning to look forward to say, okay, now that children have a vaccine, can we actually put a, a timeline on when schools don't have to have masks on? So that's exciting stuff because when I look out at the 300 plus faces out there, I'm really looking out at the 300 plus eye, pairs of eyes out there. And that's just not right. the same thing. As Are your students spaced throughout the class? Is there uh, spacing or are they all sitting side by side, like movie theater style? Yeah. If all 355 came to class, they would probably be tightly packed. But given that we don't have a hundred percent attendance, I think the days that I can get 70% attendance feel great. And, but the, it's a big enough room where they can spread out a little bit. And that's partly because I changed my own personal philosophy in terms of where people sit in that it's an auditorium with an upstairs balcony and even though if it was not COVID, not pandemic, not masking, I would have urged everybody to stay downstairs and not use the balcony. But in good conscience, I could not force everybody to sit movie style shoulder to shoulder when we had a whole balcony upstairs where uh, you could spread out and deal with that anxiety that I know many students and actually many of our colleagues still have about being in close proximity. Of course, you would have a balcony for your gen site class. Of course. I'm surprised you don't have a popcorn at intermission also mm, um, for gen psych. <laughs> That's not a bad idea. So we are, we do teach over the lunch, the lunchtime <laughs> hour or so. Uh, yeah. I can see it coming. So just a couple more things and I'll stop on gen psych. Um, I have to tell you that it makes me feel a little bit good that you live with the mere mortals and that you don't have a hundred percent perfect attendance every day, that even some people blow off a Dr. Gurung class and that you don't have perfect attendance every day. That I think as in the picture of things that I've gotten better at over the years, one of the best things that I reflect on and smile about is how I can now look out there and it's not just the social psychologist in me, but I could look out there at an empty seat and go, there are many attributions for why that seat is empty. Right. And I think that's important for everybody listening to keep in mind. I think it's so easy for us to take it personally. I'll take it another step. That student whose eyes start drooping and then close and take it and maybe even slumps back in the chair fast asleep. I remember that wonderful day. I remember that wonderful day when the first thought that came to mind wasn't man, I must be really boring. And it was, wow, that student must have had quite the night. And it was an automatic thought that popped in, but it made me feel so much better whether or not it was the truth. Well, yeah. And we at Boise State, our students a little bit tend to be non-traditionally aged. We're more of a commuter campus. And I had a student in my capstone class, which meets at 1.30 in the afternoon, come up and say, I work the graveyard shift. So oftentimes I'm working 7 to 11, I'm sorry, 11 to 7, and then going to 9 o'clock classes. So if I'm dead tired in your class, I promise you, it's not because I'm bored with the topic. It's just, I haven't been to bed yet. Yeah. And so whether it's partying or an overnight shift, I think you're exactly right. The attribution of that, it's not me. I mean, even sometimes a U.S. president can fall asleep at a global <laughs> conference. It may not be because it's boring. It might've been just because he just took a transnational flight. Yeah. Yeah. Just one more thing about attributions, because it's another one that I found myself thinking about recently. And I know many of us who are faculty are often 
frustrated sometimes with the types of emails that we get. And I res and, and in this case, I'm referring to the type of email that goes, I'm really not feeling very good. I don't think I'll come to class today. And I just wanted to let you know. And I've been, this term, I've been getting a decent number of those. And there are so many different thoughts that run through your head. The first thought sometimes is, I see the subtext here. Are you saying if there's an in-class activity, will I be able to make it up? Are you saying, I mean, you've avoided saying the classic, will I miss something important? That's not there. But there's another part of that, which again, may or may not be true, but I believe it is. And that is, I don't want you to think I'm not coming because of you or the class. I want you to know that I'm not coming because I'm really not feeling good. And I just love that. I, and I, I, there have been a lot of, of, of emails like that. And uh, I know looking at Twitter and talking to individuals, I think we're all experiencing an interesting, an interesting two sides of the coin, which is yes, all the excitement to be back on campus, but that's not necessarily translating to be attend classes all the time. And, and I think that's really been interesting to see because boy, I can tell you, I can feel the excitement on campus, but that's not necessarily translating into 80, 90% attendance every class. Yeah. Well, but, and uh, yeah, and but, some conversations yeah, that I've had. No, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Yeah. But I was just going to say more of those emails coming in with the, I'm not feeling good. So I'm not coming. You're right. Maybe it's just the, maybe it's the student angling for something or getting ready to ask for something. And I also think that faculty members have fear. And I think sometimes it's when you're earlier in your career, but not necessarily so. Faculty members have a fear sometimes of, for lack of a better term, getting the wool pulled over their eyes. Yeah. They don't want to get tricked or taken advantage of having a student getting a makeup test when they didn't really need it or getting an accommodation when they didn't deserve it. And so I think faculty members, I mean, clearly they don't want to do extra work when they don't have to. But asking for things like doctor's notes or in the extreme case, asking for the handout from the funeral they attended yeah. their grandfather when they went to their grandfather's funeral and there was a handout at the funeral parlor in the extreme case. I think faculty members just don't want to be duped. Right. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. And I, and I think, you know, that goes on to words like trust that relates to deadlines and late penalties and all those things, right? And I think this time, especially the pandemic has been a wonderful, and I know that's an odd two words to put close to each other, but it's been, I think, a, a key time to really think about a lot of the practices that we've been so used to. I can remember a, your Charles Brewer Award address where you talked about grading and how having a 10 or 20, well, 10 levels of grading, can we really make the difference between those grade levels? And now a few years since that talk, there's so much more talk about ungrading, right? Which is the conversation that you essentially had with, you know, starting back then. So that's something I've been thinking a lot about specifications, grading yes, and ungrading and ungrading and also deadlines. And I can tell you it is with 300 plus 355 enrolled, it is so much easier for me to actually be flexible than to cater to 20% of emails from the night before something is due saying, I'm really stressed, I'm really sick, can I have an, and now with my no penalty within the course policy, which is what I have, there's less pressure on the student to A, drag themselves to class if they're experiencing symptoms because they'll miss something and B, stay up even later in the night that they're not feeling good about feeling good. So. That, that has, that is my philosophy at the very other end of the spectrum of show me the certificate or the receipt from the emergency room visit yeah. that I've seen, you know, and I've heard about. Yeah. Not from so me. One, one more thing about your interests, uh, your gen site course. And I, now that I'm thinking about this, you posted this on uh, Instagram and I know you well enough to know, not in a braggadocious way, that's just not your, in your DNA. For people who don't know you, who are listening to this, you posted on your first day of class in Gen Psych that for the first time in your career, you got a standing ovation at the end of class. What do you think that was about? I, and, and, and just to be clear, the first day, 
Right, right. Right. That first day, that was pretty mind blowing. Uh, and I actually think it was the whole, we are so, all so great, uh, so happy to be back in person in a classroom. And I think that energy, that was what I was, was getting was like, yay, it's day one of the first time we're back after 18 months. That is a very, okay. That's a very Regan Gurung reply. Cause that's very humble. So you got back to your department, you talked with other colleagues from around the university. How many other standing ovations did you hear about at the Oregon State University? We, we don't talk about those kind of things. Okay. All right. I'll, I'll let that go. But I appreciate the sentiment. It was, and I'll, I'll give you, I'll, I, I will give you one more. I, I think it's, I put that in the, everybody's happy to be back. I'll actually be, I'll actually take it one step further. I was so excited to be back that I think that probably came through as well. Yeah. Don't, don't you think your students were savvy enough to see that? I mean, I think if you surveyed your gen psych students, sincerely with real effort and ask them how many of their other first day classes they went to, did they end up giving a standing ovation? I think the answer would be zero. I would bet you that even though, yes, your explanation of they were excited on day one is plausible but to quote you from earlier in this podcast, there's an interaction. <laughs> There's that first day by guru interaction that went on up here. And that's when that event happens. Main effects and interactions. Got to love them. It's the Stephen Chu of life, isn't it? It's all about the go. dying way interaction. There you go. There you go. So, so Regan, you, if I can remember correctly, PhD, a UW in Seattle. Yep. Postdoc at UCLA, right? Shelly yep. Taylor. Yep. West Coast. And then first job post, post doc, first doc at this Midwestern place, uh, University of Wisconsin, Green Bay. And you park yourself and your wife there for 20 years. Is that correct? 20 years. Absolutely. So why'd you leave? And we'll be right back. Coming in 2022, Macmillan Learning's Achieve for Psychology sets a whole new standard for integrating assessments, activities, and analytics into your teaching. And Achieve is now home to Macmillan's new video collection for introductory psychology, an extraordinary archive of 220 in-demand videos, including classic clips, contemporary footage, and exclusive original content. Developed in partnership with a faculty and student advisory board, it's a remarkably diverse and relevant resource with videos tagged to the seven themes in the American Psychological Association's new intro psych initiative. See for yourself and tell us what you think. To get a special preview of the collection, go to macmillanlearning.com forward slash psych sessions. Macmillan's Achieve for Psychology, engaging every student, supporting every instructor, setting the new standard for teaching and learning. So, why'd you leave? Yeah. Sorry, is that, did I do that too blunt? No, no, you know, is that, well, 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 there's the objective answer and then the, the subjective pieces behind the things like that. And the objective answer was the wonderful Oregon State reached out, the wonderful Dr. Kathy becker Bleas, uh, who is a visionary leader. She is uh, And I'm not just saying that because she's also my boss, but she is my boss and she's a visionary leader. And I think she reached out and she had a vision for psychology at Oregon State and a vision for what Gen Psych at Oregon State could be. And she reached out and asked if I'd be interested in helping that vision come through. And uh, it was uh, just an absolute wonderful opportunity. Uh, it so happened and you set it up nicely. I'd been on the West Coast. I enjoyed the West Coast. Both my family and my wife's family, Martha's family are on the West Coast. So I had never looked for a job 
either actively or inactively or passively. I had not never looked for a job. I had some pretty good offers in those 20 years, but I would imagine so, but never looked for a job or applied for anything in those 20 years. But I think the timing was just absolutely right where I was looking for some challenges. I was, this was right in the middle of the APA intro psych initiative work. So I was thinking a lot about intro psych. And there were opportunities here beyond the department, which is where I'm sitting right now, outside the department, as it were, that were very tantalizing and provided things that I've always was curious about that I thought, yeah, let's check this out. Okay. So, I, so I threw my hat in the ring. Okay. Okay. So, <clears throat> all right. So yeah, here's where we may have to take out the edit clippers later post recording or in post as they say, but you did say something along the way there where you were looking for new challenges. So does that mean as a full professor, and I'm uh, obviously I'm assuming you are a tenured full professor at uh, UWGB, you had served as chair. I think you had, did a stint as associate dean, if I recall. Yep. Call, yep. Right? Yep. So, I mean, you were kind of in a place where you could design your own challenges. I mean, I mean I'm, in a, I'm a full professor 30 years in. I can design my own challenges. So clearly, I'll buy that something was tantalizing, and I'll buy that Kathy becker Bleese is an amazing leader and a visionary. But is there another piece of that puzzle, or do you not want to go there? Well, no, I think it's right there. It's, it, the, the piece of the puzzle is more challenges. And for a variety of reasons, we all know that different universities have different priorities. Different systems have different priorities. The, the University of Wisconsin system had was probably seven years into a lot of shakeup from the time unions were done away with to changes in priorities and budget issues. So there was only so many, there were only so many things that were possible there. And there are some things in terms of, even if you're a full professor, you cannot create the funding for a graduate program. And one of the big, the biggest, one of the biggest, there were many appealing things about Oregon State, but one of the big appealing things about Oregon State was the psych department's explicit PhD program in applied cognition. And here was a chance to really do a, a scholarship of pedagogy, a scholarship of teaching and learning type of grad program. I mean, it's for all practical purposes, it's the only one, if not the first major one in, in the nation where a grad student can go and combine different areas of psychology focused on teaching and learning. And boy, that this, there's just no way a regional university can aid pull that out of thin air. So yeah, that, so, it's, so there were those very realistic barriers. And even though I think if you had said, can you put into words exactly what you would want and then you'd stay, I don't know if I'd exactly think about that in that way. But when Oregon State said, here's what we are doing, I was like, wow, I didn't know that and I'd love to. Well, I, I, I appreciate, so first of all, I appreciate you putting up with my pokiness there with poking around. But I think you kind of hit it from what I understand, which is UWGB wasn't going to generate a PhD program and have doctoral students around. UWGB wasn't going, as much as I know that you adored the people there, they weren't going to generate, they weren't going to become a land grant. No. And it, they weren't going to have the cachet or the flex or the power that land grant universities have in the United States. And there's just no denying that. And so I certainly get it. And a tidbit that for the audience members, I can now put into perpetuity, which I will never let Regan forget. I knew about Oregon State before he did. <laughs> because a year before he actually uh, started looking into it, I was invited out to give, some, give a talk and do some consulting. So I got to meet those folks who are absolutely lovely before he did. Indeed. Indeed. Absolutely. So, so you start out there, what is it, 18? No, 2019. So fall of 2019. So you don't even have a full year before the pandemic hits. Exactly. Exactly. Wow. So you barely get moved into your office before you have to move out of your office. That's, that's right. So, so you get the job and you're employed by uh, the School of Psychological Science. I'm going to say it correctly. Not yep, the SBS. Exactly. The School of Psychological Science. But wait. There's more. There's a twist. The plot begins. Twist. Do, do, do you want to talk about 
the twist? Yeah, so so, so the, the twist is really interesting, and, and I'd love to talk about the twist because a, a good group of us talked about twists like this at the recent STP-ACT conference. And the twist was that at Oregon State, there actually happened to be the possibility of doing some Center for Teaching and Learning work. And at the time that I was considered for the site job, it was a possibility. And I signed my contract in January of 2019. And then I got this really interesting call from, from Kathy who said, Hey, you know what? The, the provost just called, uh, the vice provost just called and the acting director of the Center for Teaching and Learning has left and resigned. And she was wondering if you'd be interested in doing some work there. And I've been doing teaching and learning stuff for a really long time. It was intriguing. It corresponded. This was very close to when the family and I were visiting Corvallis, Oregon to check out where we would be living and uh, had actually a meeting with the provost and the, actually the two vice provosts and Kathy and talked about possibilities. And a few months later, I agreed to being an inter interim di uh, executive director of the Center for Teaching and Learning. And uh, yeah, and that it was a 0.5 position and still is a 0.5 position. And of course that interim became a lot longer of an interim because COVID happened. And the last thing I think anybody wanted was to change what was going on at the Center for Teaching and Learning while 2000 faculty were pivoting from face-to-face -to, -face to, to remote teaching. So yeah. Okay. So can I unpack that a bit? <laughs> sure. So you you signed a contract in January of 2019 to go to SPS. Yep. But you don't start at Oregon State until is September. Yeah, September. The, the the term starts in September. But you're you're not even there yet when you get a phone call that says, "Hey, Regan, we'd like you to take a second job on our campus." Am I getting that right? Yeah. It, yes. Yes. Consider. I mean, Oregon's a very, a very nice, polite, respectful place. What do you consider? What do you think about? <laughs> you know, yeah. You haven't even gotten there and started your first job yet. True. True. They're already calling you and asking you, would you like a second job? Well, and like I said, all the better, because if I didn't fully get into the routine of one job, there was less changes to adopt to a sec, adapt to a second one. All right. So why not just do it from the get go? <laughs> <laughs> but to Kathy's credit, she had just hired a full professor to do a 1.0 FTE job in her department. And either A, she just gifted half of her professor line yes. to somebody else, or she knew that even though on paper she gifted, and I'm doing air quotes for our listeners, she gifted 0.5 FTE, but she knew that you were going to give in effort, 1.0 or close to it. Well, and that's why the very first thing was I did chat with Kathy and say, hey, you know what? I'm com I was coming for psych. What do you think about this? And here again, to, to Kathy's credit, I sort of loved what she said. She said, you know what? This is good for psychology and it's good for the university. And, and I, I think Kathy is such a dedicated, student-focused, teaching is important kind of leader that she felt that this would probably help teaching at OSU even beyond the bounds of SPS, which was, which I give her great credit for because I definitely gave her the opportunity for say, I would, to say, I would rather you didn't do that. And she was quite the opposite. She was, but, I would but, support your call. But Regan, let's pretend like the recording <laughs> button is off for a moment, shall we? Let's pretend it's just me and you having a chat. And no one else is listening. When Oregon State hires you at 0.5 SPS and 0.5 Center for Teaching and Learning, they didn't get 0.5 and 0.5, right? They got like 0.7 and 0.7 or 0.8 and 0.8. I mean, really? Seriously, you didn't do 20 hours a week for SPS and 20 hours a week for the Center for Teaching and Learning. Did you really stop? working at 40 hours a week, because if you did, that probably would have been sometime Wednesday afternoon. <laughs> but you know, but, but I don't think any of us in higher education do that. I, I think, and I, I know that's exactly part of the problem is far too often folks just try to get everything done. And I think 
the way I'm surviving is, I'd like to say really having a good time doing it, is try to be as efficient as possible. And I think I've worked up some tricks over these last uh, 25 years in higher education. So I, first off, I would like to talk to you about those. But before we get there, so how, so you were in Green Bay for 20 years, but that means so was your wife, Martha, and both of your children, who I happen to know and adore, were born in Green Bay. So how did the family adjust to the move? We'll be right back. The Psych Sessions podcast is sponsored by Hawks Learning. Are you looking for more affordable, quality materials for your intro psych students? Check out Hawks Learning's mastery-based courseware and texts. These materials introduce foundational psychology and research concepts that inspire students of all majors to think more critically about the world around them. Take advantage of software features designed with student learning in mind like customizable lessons that allow you to add videos, Google Slides, forms, and more to illustrate concepts and deepen understanding. Explore these materials, available to students for as low as $43, alongside free chapter projects and example videos at www.hawkslearning.com forward slash psych sessions. Again, that's www.hawkslearning.com forward slash psych sessions. I can still remember that day in January when we called the kids down to the kitchen and we said, hey, this was lunchtime and they knew something was going on. And this was scant minutes after I'd actually formally signed the contract, right? So I'd actually now signed the contract. It is black and white and PDF'd. And we're like, okay, now this is really happening. It was, I can remember the day in January and we called them downstairs. And for all of you out there who are trying to think about sharing stuff with kids, here's our story. And we called them down and we finished lunch and we said, hey, so we have some news for you. And we had, we, Martha and I had kept it complete off the table. No discussions at all. They had no clue whatsoever. Right. Uh, and they came down and we said, and we, we gave them the news. And my kids who reacted in what is classic, their fashion. My son said, hmm, okay. And my daughter absolutely broke out in tears and started crying. She didn't want to leave her friends. She didn't want to leave everything there. About 90 seconds in to the crying, she said, does this mean maybe we can get a dog? And that was at 90 seconds in. And we smartly said yes, because one of the reasons we didn't get a dog in Green Bay was because we said that the house wasn't best for it. And that's mostly true. But then my wife and her wonderful infinite wisdom also brought up something that had been, you know, getting to my daughter, which was, you said you wanted uh, a little bit more space in your room. Maybe you can, this is a great opportunity to help us pick the house that you can get. And my daughter thought about that. And uh, two minutes later, she disappeared. And we thought maybe she's just composing herself. But she returned and lo and behold, she had made herself a Zillow account and had put in Corvallis. Wow. And she was, uh, so this was literally minute six after telling her uh, that was her coping. She just turned it around and literally for the next two or three weeks would tell us whenever she would get a Zillow notification on the house that met her specifications. So, and for the record, she was 10 at the time. So, yeah, I was just going to ask, how does a 10 year old know about Zillow? Kids these days. <laughs> yeah, I, but, I mean, I know about Zillow, but that's because <laughs> it's been fun watching the fake value of my house go up because I don't think it's real, but that, so. So yeah, that was, that was both the illegal for thing. having coping skills yeah. and coping yeah. mechanisms. Well, and I think it's one of those things, all of us who know kids, even my son's reaction, that may have been his immediate stiff upper lip. Up, right. up, and it, there were, it, it was weeks and or maybe weeks later where he had to deal with it and stuff like that, but he did. And I think the biggest issue was us getting here, uh, getting set with school and then COVID happening. And I think in, in, in some ways that was good for the family because we all spent time together. Uh, in a new place. And in a, in a new, new place, home. in a new home. So, yeah. So did, did Melina actually find the home you're in on Zillow before the three of you moved in? 
the four of you moved in? Did, well, did, did she locate it before anybody else? So the housing market is, is such that houses move very quickly. And so the house we are currently in came up very quickly. We had to jump at things like that. Actually, the house that she really wanted was a contender and it was gorgeous, but it was right on the very lip of a hill. And once we visited it, all of us on the West Coast are expecting a big earthquake sometime <laughs> in the next X years. And although you could say, yeah, what's probability? But in this case, that house was so much on the lip of the hill that if there was even a minor issue, we knew there would have been a problem. So, but boy, that was one we were very close to going with. That was on her list for sure. Yeah, Regan, it's really interesting how, and I know other people have done this as well, find the silver lining. I mean, the COVID silver lining was your family has just moved cross country and COVID, although limiting some opportunities in many ways, gives the four of you a chance to gel in this new place, in this new hole. Yeah. Oh, I mean, ab absolutely. Absolutely. And I think the in stock contrast to our in stock contrast to our Green Bay house, this one uses space differently. And I think space was the key during the pandemic, right? Having space for two adults to work and for two kids to go to school. And I think just the number of times that I acknowledge my own privilege, there was that privilege of having that space was something many of our students and many, some of our colleagues did not have. And, and that's really what made it, made it all possible to happen. Yeah, it, absolutely. I want to circle back to, you mentioned productivity in over 25 years. You are phenomenally productive in many different aspects. One of, one of my fun facts right now is that in, there's an APA flyer that you can get by mail or you can see it online, but there's an APA advertising flyer for APA books. And there's a teaching page of <laughs> APA books where Regan Gorum has two books be currently being advertised on the same page, which is really awesome for a couple of reasons, because with the lag in publishing, how busy he was 12 to 18 months ago. So that's just one of many. Plus, if you look at stuff that you've published recently and all that. So do, do you have tips that you could share with our listeners that you've acquired over the past 25 years? I mean, how do you pull it off? How, how do you do it? I think, so ver coming very close to the conversation we just had, it really starts with having a wonderfully supportive family and a wonderfully supportive partner. That's really the start of it. I think I've been fortunate, blessed, fortunate, all the whichever words you want, where the kids are at a stage now where they are more independent. The kids are uh, at a stage and aware they do what they should do and have to do without a lot of parental intervention. But that said, I have a wonderful partner who uh, we both try to pay very close attention to when each other are having extra challenges or needs and we're there for each other. So love, love that. Uh, so it really starts there. I think if it wasn't for the support from home, that's the big part. Now, I know many of us have support at home, which is great. I think beyond that, I think the single biggest element for me is a very clear compartmentalization of when I do what. So you alluded to the, when you're, when many of us have different positions, different hats that we wear, that right there can soak up things. And the biggest change in being in an administrator or even a half-time administrator over the last few years is that. Now, during the day, and I know you, I'm sure you experience this as chair as well, during the day, most of the time is often taken up with administrative stuff. I mean, there's no time to do other kinds of work. So, so what, one of the things that I've come up with is being very clear on when, on carving up time for when to do writing work and, and, and holding to it. I think holding to it. And that's been the single biggest thing that I've aimed to do. And, and yes, that means there are probably a lot fewer shows that I've watched that I would like to watch. It means that weekdays in particular tend to be very much a lot of work all the time, but it's being very open to the fact that there's administrative work, 
this time I must and want to spend with my family. And here's a big one for all, especially those of us who teach Gen Psy can talk about this sleep right after family time and things like that. I prioritize getting sleep and I, and that's just such, I, I love the, the science geekiness of that whole thing, which is boy, if we just get more sleep, even our waking hours are so, so much more productive. And that has actually been one of the things that I've, I have prioritized higher than some other things. And I will admit, I've prioritized sleep even over physical activity. And I know the health psychologist in me goes, no, that's crazy. Physical activity is important as well. And I try and get some. And you and I shared neck pain issues and muscle issues earlier. But, but yeah, that's, I think, in a nutshell, the biggies is thankful for the support, work very hard at the compartmentalizing and not letting one hat's work spill into another hat's time. As it were. Uh, first off, I really appreciate you sharing all that. That was a two. Oh, I don't buy it. I mean, I, first off, I believe everything you said. I, I think the story is more complicated than that because I believe you. I, but it, there, Regan, there's a special sauce here that I think you have, and maybe a couple other colleagues that I know in the US have that. I will tell you in my life right now, I don't have, I once had it, maybe I'll get it back again, July 1st, 2023, when I'm no longer chair, but you have, your productivity is at a level that most people don't have. And it's okay if you, if, first off, if you don't agree with me, and it's okay if you can't even describe it, but you're cranking high quality stuff out at a pace that doesn't feel like it has slowed you down now that you have two jobs. I think, I guess there is one other element uh, in there, Eric, and, and, I, and, and that's being blessed. And I know that's such a general word and it's not, not necessarily secular, but I, I, I'll still like to use it because the spirit is good. Great collaborators. I mean, you mentioned those two, two on the same page, which I'll admit was quite the thrill to see those publications there in the same spot. But you'll also notice that it's not so big shout out to Pam Ansberg and Mark Basham who collaborated and not just collaborated, who led the effort on thriving in academia. And of course, to uh, your friend and mine, Garth Neufeld, and of course yourself and the other 20 individuals of the APA Intro Psych Initiative for making that happen. So I think it would have been totally different if it ha was a single authored publication or I had to be lead on, or if I was lead on everything. I mean, a lot of the work, if when I look down at my CV is, I can't, I mean, it's the rare occasion where I am solo author. I just love working with people and I have just absolutely wonderful, hardworking, conscientious folks to, to work with. And that same spirit, Aaron Richmond, Guy Boys, and I pulled off some good stuff over these last two years, but that's because Guy and Aaron are just super hard workers and great at what they do. So that's part of that. And I should have led with that. Or I shouldn't say led with that. That should have been on my previous list, but it's collaboration, Eric, it's collaboration. And you know that because you and I do a lot of fun stuff together, but find those collaborators who you have fun with. I think that's very good advice for our listeners, but I, there's a section of variance there that we're not explaining. And maybe it's not explainable in a one hour conversation. Maybe it's going to take a pub talk or two. I don't know. There you go. There you go. Yeah. Pulling all that stuff together. So I do, but I, and I do want to ask something a little bit related and I don't think it's touchy, but maybe it's personal. Is there, and maybe it's just because I have this view of you and I kind of think others do too. Is there anything that, you know, professionally, academically that you struggle with? Because I got to tell you from the outsiders looking in, it looks like that you are successful at everything that you do. And I think it might be helpful to some of our listeners to know, oh, even Regan Guru struggles with X, or even he tried this once and wasn't so good at it. And if you don't have any of those, or if you don't feel like sharing them, I completely respect that prerogative, but it just sounds like you conquer everything you attempt. Well, well, thank you for that. For, thank you for saying that, Eric. And I think right there in that comment is part of the answer. And it's that last phrase there, everything you attempt. I'm very 
that's one of the ways I've really evolved over the last 10 to 15 years. It's really only attempting certain things. And I'll say my main criteria for what I attempt and what I say yes to is things that I really enjoy and things that I'm really passionate about. And I wish for all of the listeners that they could only work on the things that they're really passionate about. And I will admit, obviously, there are some things in the higher ed life where you may not be that enthused about that you still have to do. Oh, those things are still there. But for the most part, I try very hard to only say yes to or do those things that I'm really passionate about because then that passion makes sure that I can do the best job I can at it. There are a number of you, you for one, also in, in the, the Rocky Mountain area who talk about no committees and the no folders. I've taken that kind of advice to heart where even though it's uncomfortable sometimes to say no, I still say no. So it's a sampling bias, right? What I'm left with is the stuff that I know I'm good at or have been good at and can be good at and I really care about. So that's, I think, one big part of it. There is an answer too. I mean, you asked and I'll tell you, there are some areas that do take more time. I think there are some new st statistics that take more time to write up, to, to work on. There are especially especially some elements of research design that correspond to n newer and different statistical analyses. Yeah, that does take some more time. And, and I think you don't get to see that because by the time you see output, you know, those things have been dealt with. But that's the tough stuff is some of the new articles coming out where you go, wow, that's those aren't stats that I've done before. And you got to work a little harder to try and understand what was done and what's going on. I, I'm going to push just a little bit more than I promise I'll give it up. D like, have you had, like, you invented a new course that you taught a special topics course and you taught it and maybe it was a summer school course or something, a boutique course, what I would call, and it just bombed. Or maybe you collected data on a topic and you submitted it to a journal and they got rejected and you took it to another journal and you had data and you believed in it and it never got published. I mean, I've got examples of each of those as failures or not successes. I mean, I, I, I guess I'm trying to think, I've try, I'm trying to figure out, do you walk among us mere mortals? Or you know, yeah. are, are you really part of the Marvel universe or the DC universe? I guess I'm just trying to figure that out. Maybe I'm just trying to make myself feel better. Well, Maybe that's what I'm you know, doing. It's, you know, I, I think this is that same category of you only see publications. You tend to only see publications with a significant p-value or the significant confidence intervals. I think all of us have that graveyard of projects that we've left by the wayside. And, and yeah, I mean, and yeah, absolutely. There are things that even in recent times where I really thought about something and went, oh, this is really good. And, and I think for the most part, now that I think about it, they, they all seem to be in that same area of, hey, my vision isn't matching what reviewers want. And I especially think about working with big publishers who want a certain project. And Given what I just said previously, I agreed to that certain project because it was something I was passionate about. And what I was passionate about was my view of how that project should be. And there have been at least a couple of cases where, you know, one year of work in, the reviewers didn't necessarily agree with that vision, or more importantly, the publishers wanted me to align more with the reviewer comment versus sticking with my own vision. And I've had to say, you know what, I'm not going to do that anymore and I'm going to hang on to this. Now, sometimes that works out where it finds another home. In other cases, it doesn't. And I think those are probably, to get at when I reflect on your question, that's probably my biggest area where I would go, yeah, there was some time spent on that. It didn't necessarily go out and, and find its natural endpoint like some of the other projects. But th that's the big area right there is that match. And I think I've just gotten better at, I've got a lot better at going. At the end of the day, I'm glad that I still stuck to my vision or my feelings about it. Well, and you've, now you've gone and done it because now you've really st stumbled into a really interesting area that I, I appreciate, which is, See, I don't see that as a mistake or a error at all. I see that as you had a vision for something that is very is probably very likely and ahead of its time 
and publishers or or book houses just can't see it because you've your boots on the ground teaching students and what they need or consulting with faculty in your CTL what they need and publishers because they have to are looking at a book model a publishing model a profit model and obviously there's oftentimes a disconnect between those two so see I don't see that as a wasted effort on your part that you stuck to your guns I see that as you were ahead of your time and the publishers haven't caught up to you yet. Well, I mean, and that's just a very nice way of putting it, Eric, and I appreciate it. I mean, there's also the, hey, at the end of the day, if you can't convince, uh, I'd, let's use that wonderful phrase, if you can't move the needle <laughs> with, with on reviews, then maybe your stuff isn't good enough to move the needle. And well, I, Do we want to do this? You mean if I have enough skin in the game? There you go. Exactly. Right. I mean, all you can drag out all those wonderful publisher phrases and uh, yeah. And I'm actually, I'm maybe in my older age, I'm okay with, yeah, maybe that wasn't good enough for what you're, for you to invest in it. And I'm okay with that. And I'm okay with that. Yeah. We've got a little bit of time left. I don't know if you had any place that you wanted to go. I could take you down the path of publishing in the year 2021 if you want to but is was there any topic that you wanted to make sure oh my gosh i want to talk to eric during this part too you know, you, you know actually yeah a, a couple of different things and you can, you can you can pick and choose whichever i th i think this talk now is happening at a time where Many of us need to weigh, to what extent does somebody have to be in an office to work, right? To what, I think all these notions of remote teaching, remote working, remote, the whole remote element, there's so much there for us educators to think about and us administrators to think about and us colleagues to think about. I will tell you, this term seems, this term seems to be a meeting bonanza where there are tons of departmental meetings going on. And the, if, let me think, is it the absolute majority? No, it's all of them with the exception of full faculty meetings have been remote. And it's been remote even when we've been down the corridor from each other for some, but those have made our work so much more effective and efficient that I think it's something we all need to think about which meetings can take place in this way and save us a whole bunch more time. So that's number one, is that I think this is a wonderful time to say, because it all goes back to efficiency, right? I mean, to, to pick up a theme from earlier on, how, do, how can we all get more done and more done well? And maybe not even more done, right? Why don't push ourselves more? How about, how can we even get the stuff that we need to get done in a way to, to, and not, you know, hurt ourselves mentally and physically. And I think there are these efficiencies in what we learned during the pandemic that, that we can bring up. So that's, that's one point. Yeah. And, and I wondered if you're seeing that in your work as well. Absolutely. So, so I currently serve as department chair and because I looked it up uh, today for an email I wrote, I currently serve as department chair for 596 more days. Not that I'm counting or anything like that. <laughs> and we hold a faculty meeting every Thursday at noon. And we have a conference room that has a, a technology set up where everyone in the room is on one camera, but then we broadcast over Zoom and we make it completely flexible. You can be at home, you can be at a remote location, you can be away at a conference, or you can be in the room with us. And we don't care. We don't dictate. We do every faculty meeting over Zoom. And it's an electronic agenda. And anybody can add to it. It's a Google Doc. And so I think that kind of flexibility will go forward for us. To speak more to your point, though, we have a faculty meeting, a faculty member who came to us this semester full tenured associate professor and said, I want to move to Oregon with my family and I want to live there and I want to be a telecommuting faculty member. Mm -hmm. And we said, yeah, let's make it happen. So we went to the dean, we went to the provost and we're working on making it happen because why shouldn't she, as long as she can do her teaching, research and service, beam into meetings, she's still gonna have the same research. She's still gonna work with undergraduate RAs, just like people did during the pandemic. She's still gonna have to attend 
committee meetings, right. just like we did during the pandemic. Why shouldn't we work to make it flexible for people the way they want it as long as they're getting their work done? We adjusted workload. We adjusted the evaluation system. Why shouldn't we meet people where they are, where they want to be? Yep. Yeah, that's, and I think that's both for our own personal state of minds and for our departments and getting bigger with higher ed. I think that's one big topic right there where I think we can all join in the conversation with being upfront about what is working better and what does it. And it's not going to be the same thing for everybody. I mean, I'll be honest with you. I really enjoy coming into work and getting a whole bunch of stuff done here and then going home and not doing at home the kinds of stuff that I'm doing at work. And again, you can see the arc back to previous, but I try to, to circumscribe my administrative work to being in this office that I'm now talking to you from. And of course, as an administrator, I've got to be vigilant on weekends and, and weeknights, but that's a different kind of vigilance. And I, I'm not going to put together a document on a weekend or a weeknight those are times for family and the other things that I want to get done. And I think how, where you work makes a difference, but that's me. And, and I like that. My, my wife works uh, uh, from home completely and she really likes that. So it's having those conversations. And then of course, dealing with the, what do you do about the, the water cooler conversation that you're missing out on? Well, I think you nailed it, Regan. It, it's not a one size fits all. We have some faculty members who love being in the physical department and they do exactly what you do. When they're at work, they're at work. When they're at home, they're at home. And they don't mix those two together. We have some faculty members who have little kids at home but they love coming into the department to have the space to do the work. We have some faculty members who have little kids at home that like working at home because they are doing homeschooling or whatever. They have the hybrid uh, school, and so they need to be at home for something. So giving them the flexibility and not having a one-size-fits-all policy. The, the issue is going to become probably perceptions, meaning I think we're going to, we are experiencing some pushback with upper administration and probably the public as well. Why do we have to keep building buildings if we're going to have fewer faculty members in them? Right. Why do we have to keep building large classrooms if we're having fewer classes held in them? So if we're going to have a bunch of empty hallways up here, then our justification of space needs becomes different. If faculty members are doing online research, then how does that affect the budget request for research support? So we're going to have, we're going to have to get savvy about this, be thoughtful about it. Resource allocation, resource requests. We're going to have to get good at this. Yeah. So, you know, so, so just because I want to make sure we can hit a bunch of cool things, right? I hear you on that. Here, here's another one. One thing I've really liked about, it's a privilege to know you and even have the chance to be on this the second time. But I also think about how we all need to do more to, to find those unsung heroes. And I think Psych Sessions and you and Garth have done a wonderful job of going to conferences and hearing somebody and inviting them to speak and so on and so forth. But I think all of us can do an even better job of saying, hey, here's this person in my department who may not have the, the name recognition of an Eric Landrum, but you know, who, but who may, or who, but who needs, who's really doing some great work. And I don't think we've got the best mechanisms or any good mechanisms to, to get that going. And I think this also goes to writing and things like that. Let me give you an example of something I'm going to try out. I'm going to try this out. I don't know how it's going to work, but let's see. I've always been struck by the fact that even having the ability to write a book or a textbook so often is who did you run into when and where. The whole reason I got into writing was because my publisher rep at the time and I had a great conversation. And yes, I did a great set of reviews for the publisher, which is always a, important. It was for in-depth critical reviews. But that review work combined with that rep got me an idea I had for a health psych book, made its way to the point where it could get a contract. And for all of you wondering how to get more of this stuff done, quite honestly, it was that first book and doing it on time, that's important, doing it on time and completing it, that was a domino effect to a whole bunch of other projects. 
So I've got a lot of book type of projects done, but I don't know if it would have happened if it w- as easily if it wasn't for that first book, right? So here's what I'm going to try out. I mean, that same alluded mentioned uh, health psychology book is now uh, in its its fourth edition, and I'm getting ready in 2022 to do a revision. But here's what I'm going to do that's different, Eric, and and for those who's listening, I invite anybody listening who would like some foot in the door in textbook writing to join me as a collaborating chapter author. And what I'm going to try is is entertain a bunch of people. It doesn't matter if I've, it doesn't matter who and where you are. If you've got some expertise, if you'd like to try out writing, I'm going to invite folks and I guess I'm doing it now. If you'd like to pick one or two chapters and help me revise it, you will get, I'm going to give them consulting author status, who knows, downline, one of these collaborating authors may become a co-author on the book, who knows. But I want to open it out and not go through the usual channels of, oh, this person was a reviewer, let's get them to do it. Or worse, here's somebody who's already got some sort of name, let's capitalize on their cachet and add them as an author. Now, I want to go and say, all the people out there, the, those unsung heroes who may be doing some great health psych work, here's your chance particularly if you're a minoritized individual or a person of color, we wa- I want your voice with me and I invite you to do that. So that's something I'm playing with. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to put out a more formal type of invitation along these lines, but I think I'm just really looking for how can we find ways to really invite more people to the table who, don't, who c- can't get there. Well, Regan, first off, good for you because I, I think that's an effort that has to be purposeful and thoughtful. We can't just hope it happens. We have to make it happen. So good for you. I, if I'll just add and riff on a couple of things there. I, I find the future very hopeful. When I read the STP newsletter that Tom Pusateri and someone else, I can't remember. It's a joint effort. STP puts out each month. And I look at the leadership now at all the different committees. I'm really pleased the amount of diversity that's been imbued into that organization. Uh, The other day, I went and looked at some of the newest eBooks. And if you go look at the eBooks and you look at the chapter authors, and this is a weird way for me to say it, I recognize almost none of the names. So they're not the people of my genre or generation. They're people of a newer generation of new faculty members, which is really exciting for our discipline, for our specialty area of teaching of psychology, scholarship, teaching and learning. So I I do think there's progress being made there, but you're absolutely right. It has to continue. It has to be purposeful. It has to be ongoing. Now to publishing, I just want to add this. You're exactly right. To get in the book publishing uh, club, you have to have help getting in. You, you just do. I got help from Steve Davis. I, Steve Davis was already in the club and I got to co-author a book with him. And by co-authoring a book with him and having book number one, I got to have book number two and book number three and book number four and then revise book number one. And then I was in the club. And then I was able to help some other people get into the club. It's a club. There's no doubt about it. I mean, other people got into the club for other characteristics. I mean, Albert Bandura got in the club because he did a world famous study. So did Phil Zimbardo. They got in the club different ways, or they were at a world famous psychology department. Other people get in the club different ways. So good for you for doing something innovative and inviting people and being purposeful about diversity, equity, and inclusion. Well, thank you. And uh, I do have one more. Yeah, go for it. As so, much time as you've got, I've got. Because that's right. You can always edit down as needed. But here's the thing. I'm not going to edit down. No, okay. and I have as much time as you have. So so here's the, the one thing that I've been, the, another thing or maybe something I've been really thinking a lot about recently. And you and I had the, the honor of being the founding co-editors of the Scholarship of Teaching and Learning in Psychology. And I've been doing a lot of thinking about Scholarship of Teaching, Learning and Psychology and, and what it's about. And I am realizing that even with all the work there and even all the great articles, you know, and the neat articles in teaching of psychology and and STLP and psychology of learning and teaching and in psychology, I think 
I've realized that we've actually come a long way from what Ernest Boyer really intended when he coined the phrase scholarship of teaching. And in a nutshell, this is my notch, nutshell, the scholarship of teaching was truly coined to recognize the hard work that is teaching. Part of that was doing research on your teaching, but especially once the Carnegie Association picked it up and added the L to the SOT to make it SOTL, it really became research crept in more and more. And my big point is, I think everybody was so excited about doing research on teaching and learning that they forgot about that first part, the celebrating and documenting the hard work that is teaching. And as much as I absolutely love doing research on teaching and learning, I, especially from my chair in the Center for Teaching and Learning, go, I wish there was more work done on supporting people, documenting the hard work that is teaching, the peer observations, the going beyond the student evaluations of teaching to have peer observations and teaching dossiers or things like that. That's the hard work of teaching. That's also scholarship that many people have turned away from because it's so much easier. And I know this sounds crazy, but it's easier to do, to use your disciplinary skills to do research on teaching and learning than make a case at your university and your promotion and tenure uh, uh, committee for a good scholarship of teaching dossier. So there's, there's some hope. Our uh, very own Diane Halpern, APA president, uh, SDP, or a leader back in the 90s actually gave us a way out and saying, hey, look, there's this kind of research is actually should be called the scholarship of pedagogy and give it its importance in its own right. And I think it's time to say, look, the research on teaching that is interdisciplinary, that is coming from different areas, we, we really need to, to celebrate it as research. It's not just documenting teaching anymore. That still needs to go on. But we have really got to a very new point with how much we do research on teaching and learning in the classroom. So that's a short version. I'm writing some stuff on that. You can look forward to a very fun chapter in the upcoming Victor Benassi compendium. That's an update on his Science of Learning earlier book. But that is something where for all of us who go, yeah, I want to do the, teaching, the scholarship of teaching and learning. That's great. But for those of us who would want to advance teaching as well, let's not forget about celebrating the hard work that is teaching and well, find better ways to do it. I'm glad he's updating that. Just a couple things in that vein that you make me think about, my friend. First off, it's always bothered me that we do, in terms of not celebrating teaching, that we so easily think about a course buyout when we want someone to do important things on our at university as if we don't value teaching, we can buy out of teaching, but we don't often talk about research buyouts or service buyouts. So we devalue teaching so easily. And secondly, go, hearkening back to the, our editorial time together and the co-founding of the Scholarship of Teaching and Learning in Psychology, it was a really awesome and heady time to be sitting together in Washington, D.C. and thinking about the mission statement and thinking about the different types of sections of the journal that we would have and then brainstorming a few years later about expanding it. And what an honor to be able to do that together with you and through APA. But the one thing I want to tell our listeners as we got ready to uh, celebrate our swan song in 2020 was our very last, very last issue. And I, the title is a riff on Carol Burnett. Glad to have this time together. There's an Easter egg in that journal article publication. That's all I'm going to say. And if we ever get a chance to be together face-to-face -face at a conference, and if Regan and I are giving a presentation together, ask us about it. And maybe we'll have a slide that reveals the Easter egg in that uh, conference presentation. Do you have time for me to ask you one more thing, or do you have anything else on your nope, agenda? Don't go ahead. Go ahead. So in episode, in part one of this, you hinted at something that we didn't reveal that uh, I actually got asked about a couple of times afterwards. You hinted about uh, a technique that you use to save time every day uh, <laughs> that I think you learned in grad school or your postdoc. But we never actually got around to sharing it. Do you remember what I'm talking about? Oh, absolutely. absolutely. I don't know if you still use it there, but I think I promised a handful of people I'll make him talk about it 
the next time he's on the podcast. Absolutely. Love it. Love it. And actually, it's so funny you say that because I smiled to myself as I did that very same technique yesterday or actually day before yesterday. And I was like, yeah, this still works. So, so this is in the whole, it's in the realm of how do you buy yourself more cognitive space? How do you buy yourself bandwidth? How do you buy yourself cognitive space? And this was a trick shared with me by Shelly Taylor at UCLA during my postdoc. And Shelly Taylor to me is the, the epitome of being effective, efficient, getting a lot done. And she said, here's one of the things I do. When I drive into UCLA in the morning, there's a five or six story parking lot near, near the psych building. And I see all these people going round and round looking for a spot. So firstly, they take time driving round and round looking for a spot. Then at the end of the day, they're walking round and round trying to remember where they parked. Instead, here's what I do. She drives up to the same floor and around the time she drives in, this floor is higher up and it's almost definitely empty because it's early and nobody's driven all the way up there. But she drives straight up to that floor, parks in exactly the same spot every day. And she said, you know what? Now I'm not wasting time distracted by where's my car? Where did I park today? Where is it? Clicking around, bam. And I think that story there is, for me, a model for what many of us can do with many of the areas of, of our lives. And I do that, and I'm going to share a little bonus with you there, Eric. So first off, absolutely, uh, even this morning, I, 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 I parked in exactly the same row, in exactly the same parking lot, in exactly the same row. And I modified that both when I was in Green Bay and here, where it just has to be the same row. And I park in the nearest spot to the front in the same row. It doesn't matter if it's way at the back. I'll walk extra, but that way at the end of the day, I just walk to my row and I keep walking and I'll get to my car. So that's number one, right? Big cognitive time saving there. But I don't know if I've shared this story with too many people, but it belongs. Uh, every teaching day, every teaching day for the last 24 years, I eat exactly the same lunch. <laughs> Okay, it's a peanut butter and jelly sandwich. And the peanut butter and jelly gives me a good shot of energy that I quickly burn in the two hours of class that follow it. But one of my time things is what am I going to eat? What am I going to take for lunch? And on teaching days, I completely shave off that extra mind energy by fixing, and that's my wife's word. I love that Southern fixing. I fix my lunch in exactly the same way Every teaching day, peanut butter and jelly sandwich makes me, wow, it just gives me, I feel like I have so much more time. Moral of the story, people, find those things that eat up your brain time, simplify them. You'll find yourself with a whole bunch more time and feeling a whole lot better. Yeah, I think some people do that. It might not work for higher ed, but some people do that with clothing choices. Yeah. Like they'll pick out their clothes the night before or they'll wear the same thing. They'll have multiples of the same outfit and they'll wear the same thing every day. So there are definitely some tricks, some shortcuts that you can use. There's one more they, that I don't want you to talk about. Maybe you'll be the first one to have a part three. Although I think technically Jane Helen has had like a part four, part five. We snuck her in. Yeah, good old Jane. But I think the part three someday that we teased in part one was to have you talk about your two middle initials and the significance of that. But I don't think we'll do that today because we're long on time. But that sounds, that sounds good. I'm just mentioning it here as the, as the tease for next time. And we that's can, very gentle. That's a very gentle way of me saying for all of you out there who have pestered to, to revise something and add my initials, there's a reason why. Yeah. Yeah. And the, the very brief thing is that they're important to you. Yep. Uh, they're important to, to get them right. I mean, I guess there are places where they, if you're in a list of authors and no one has their initials, I don't think it matters to you. Right. But it, if it's possible to have initials, you, you want them both. Yep. And there's a reason. But not today. Regan, as always, thank you so much for your time. Appreciate you sharing parts of your life, parts of your stories, your new transition, your excitement about your work. Thank you, my friend. Thank you, Eric.